and our next speaker is Alex Richings. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so today uh, I'd like to talk to you about a project that we've been working on uh, to basically look at the effects of the non-equilibrium chemistry of ions and molecules uh, within simulations of galaxy formation. Uh, and these are, oops, these are some of the people uh, that I've been working with uh, on this project. So I'd like to start by just going over why exactly is uh, the chemistry of ions and molecules uh, important for galaxy formation. Uh, so there are two uh, sort of main reasons why we're interested in this. Uh, firstly, uh, the chemistry is important for the uh, gas cooling rates. So in the, uh, the very basic uh, picture that we have of galaxy formation, uh, so we basically start off with a dark matter halo, and then as the gas uh, cools, it falls to the center of the gravitational potential of the halo, and then uh, the gas has angular momentum, so as it falls to the center, it uh, rotates faster and uh, forms a disk. And then the gas uh, continues to cool uh, and fragment and ultimately uh, forms the stars uh, that we can see. So we can see in this very basic sort of picture of galaxy formation that the gas cooling uh, is an important part of this. Uh, and then the gas cooling rate will depend on the abundances of the various uh, ions and molecules uh, because these different chemical species will uh, radiate away the thermal energy at different rates. And then the second reason why we're interested in the chemistry is if we want to be able to model uh, the observable uh, line emission from individual chemical species. So I show here two uh, examples of the sorts of uh, observations we might want to model from our simulations. So on the left here, we see the line emission from the uh, CO molecule, so the, uh, from the Whirlpool galaxy. Uh, so this is often used as an important uh, tracer of the molecular gas uh, in the galaxies. And then on the right here, we see uh, an image of the line emission from the C plus uh, ion. Uh, so we can see that if we want to model these kinds of uh, observations from our simulations, we need to understand uh, the chemistry of the gas. So currently, in simulations on uh, galactic scales, uh, they'll often assume that the gas is in uh, chemical equilibrium. Uh, so in other words, that the, uh, the chemical reactions uh, between the ions and the molecules have reached uh, an equilibrium or a steady state. Uh, so one example of this is that the cooling rates that are used in the simulations uh, are often taken from tables, uh, tabulated uh, as a function of density and temperature of the gas and so on, uh, but assuming chemical equilibrium. Uh, so this assumption of chemical equilibrium uh, will break down if the gas is evolving uh, very rapidly, so on timescales uh, shorter than the chemical uh, timescales of the gas. So for this project, we basically wanted to uh, develop a chemical model uh, that will allow us to follow the non-equilibrium evolution of the ions and molecules, and then uh, to implement this in hydrodynamic simulations of galaxies. So this will allow us to firstly uh, calculate the cooling rates of the gas more accurately, and secondly, it will, uh, will allow us to model the observable uh, line emission from individual chemical species. So the first uh, stage of this uh, project was to develop the chemical model itself. So for this, we basically need uh, a chemical network that will uh, contain all of the various chemical species that we want to uh, follow uh, in this model. And because we also want to use the model to uh, calculate cooling rates, we need to make sure that we include uh, all of the species that will contribute significantly uh, to the cooling rate. So we include, firstly, all of the ionization states of these 11 elements uh, here. Uh, and then we're also interested in a number of molecules. So most importantly, H2 and CO. And then there are also a number of uh, intermediate species uh, that we need for their uh, formation. So this gives us uh, 157 species in total. And then the network contains all the various uh, reactions between these species. So for example, uh, co collisional ionization, recombination, uh, photoionization from a UV radiation field, uh, formation of the H2 on dust grains, and so on. So this then just gives us a series of rate equations uh, that we can integrate in time uh, to follow these abundances. And so once we have these abundances, we can then calculate the cooling and heating rates of the gas. Uh, so there are various uh, thermal processes that we need to include for this. So for example, uh, the cooling from atomic hydrogen, from metals, uh, and from molecules such as H2, and also various uh, heating processes such as uh, the photoheating and photoelectric dust heating uh, from the UV radiation and heating from cosmic rays. So this is basically everything that goes into the chemical model. 
And then uh, we ran this uh, within uh, hydrodynamic simulations of uh, idealized, isolated uh, disk galaxies. So for this, we're using uh, the SPH code Gadget 3. And so we're actually using the version of Gadget that was developed uh, for the Eagle project. So if you're familiar uh, with the Eagle simulations, we're using some of the same uh, subgrid physics models that were used uh, in Eagle as well. So for example, for the uh, stellar feedback from supernovae. Uh, and then we just set up uh, these sort of uh, idealized isolated disk galaxies. So initially with a rotating disk of gas and stars plus a central stellar bulge uh, embedded within a dark matter halo. And so for uh, these simulations that I'll show, we have a total mass of 10 to the 11 solar masses. So this is about a factor of 10 uh, smaller than the Milky Way. Uh, and these simulations have uh, particles with 750 solar masses uh, per gas particle uh, with 100 uh, SPH neighbors. And then we ran a series of uh, simulations with different metallicities and different radiation fields to basically uh, see how these affect both the evolution of the galaxy and uh, the chemistry. So we consider firstly uh, three metallicities. So for all of these simulations, we hold the metallicity uh, fixed. So we're not including uh, the enrichment from stars. So we consider from 1% solar up to solar metallicity. And then uh, for the 10% solar uh, metallicity, we then repeat with different radiation fields. Uh, so for all the simulations, we basically have a constant and uniform UV radiation field. Uh, and then we apply a, a local self-shielding model on top of that so that each uh, gas particle can become locally shielded uh, from the radiation field. Uh, so for our fiducial model, we use the local interstellar radiation field measured in the, the solar neighborhood in the Milky Way uh, from black 87. And then we reduce this by a factor of 10. And then we also consider the uh, redshift zero extragalactic UV background uh, from Hartmadau 2001. So this is about another uh, factor of 10 lower again. Uh, oh, and then, so for all of these, we basically run them twice. So we firstly run them with the full uh, non-equilibrium chemistry model that I just described. And then we also run them using cooling rates uh, tabulated in chemical equilibrium. So by comparing the two, uh, we can then see what effect does the non-equilibrium chemistry have uh, on the evolution of the galaxies. So here we have the three runs at the different metallicities, going from 1% solar on the left up to solar metallicity on the right. And so here we're looking at the, uh, the gas in the simulations, looking at the disk face on along the top and edge on along the bottom. Uh, so what we can see is, so as the, uh, the stars start to form, we see the stellar feedback from supernovae, which cre create these uh, bubbles of hot gas within the disk, and also drive uh, the outflows out of the disk that we can see in the edge-on views. So what we can see is that uh, as we go to higher metallicity towards the right, uh, we see more star formation and hence more stellar feedback and extending out to uh, larger radii. So this is because the metals are important uh, for cooling the gas down from a, a warm phase around 10 to the 4 Kelvin down to the cold star forming phase uh, around 100 Kelvin or so. So basically as we go to higher metallicity, uh, there's more metal so it's easier for the gas to cool down to the cold uh, star forming phase and hence we see uh, stronger star formation. And then so here, and then here we have uh, the same again for now for the different radiation fields. So it's now going from the strongest UV on the left down to the weakest on the right. And so now that we can see as we decrease the UV radiation field, we again see uh, more star formation and hence more stellar feedback. Uh, so this is because the UV tends to uh, heat up the gas. So if we have a uh, weaker UV radiation field, then uh, there's less heating. And so again, it's easier for the gas to... Uh, cool down to the cold uh, star forming phase. So we can see these trends with metallicity and radiation field uh, more quantitatively if we plot the, the star formation histories. So here we, show, uh, we see the total star formation rates uh, in the galaxy uh, as a function of time. So this is from our highest metallicity run at solar metallicity. And then as we decrease the metallicity, uh, we can see the star formation rate is going down. So all of these runs were run with the full non-equilibrium chemistry model. And then when we ran them again, but with cooling rates in chemical equilibrium, uh, we get the dash curves here. So we can see that the dash curves and the solid curves are fairly similar here. So this is telling us that the, uh, the non-equilibrium chemistry has very little impact on the, uh, the total star formation rates uh, of the galaxy. 
And then we see the same thing again for the different radiation fields. So again, the solid curves here are showing with the full non-equilibrium chemistry. Uh, thanks. Uh, and the dashed curves are showing for the equilibrium uh, cooling. Uh, and again, there's very little difference between the two. So in general, we find that for the uh, overall dynamics of the galaxy, so the total star formation rates and so on, non-equilibrium chemistry has very little impact. Uh, but where it does become important is if we want to look at the abundances uh, of individual chemical species. So one example where this is important, is, or you see this is important, is if we want to look at the molecular outflows uh, from the galaxy. So here we look at the total mass of the molecular hydrogen that's uh, outflowing, so moving vertically away from the midplane of the disk uh, with some velocity greater than Vz, which is shown on the x-axis. Uh, so I'm only showing here the, the high metallicity run. And we can see, so the solid curve is what we get if we use the full non-equilibrium chemistry abundances. And then the dotted curve is what we, would have, it's what we would get if we take the same simulation, but just assume that all the uh, particles are in chemical equilibrium. So we can see that with non-equilibrium, we find more molecular hydrogen in the outflows by about a factor of a few or so. So this is telling us that the, the non-equilibrium chemistry is important uh, if you want to model the molecular outflows. And then finally, the uh, last thing that we looked at was uh, to model the uh, observable uh, line emission from individual chemical species. So we get this by taking snapshots from the uh, simulations and running a radiative transfer code uh, in pro post-processing on these simulations. So for this, we're using uh, the radiative transfer code, radi RADMC3D. Uh, so this includes uh, the radiative transfer of the emission lines that we're interested in and also uh, the thermal emission from dust grains, and dust scattering, and so on. So here we see uh, the line emission maps for, the, uh, for CO, molecular, so molecular CO emission. Uh, so this is from the uh, simulations with different metallicity, from low metallicity on the left up to the highest metallicity on the right. So we can see uh, with high metallicity we see much stronger uh, CO emissions. This is partly because with more metals there are more, there's more carbon and oxygen to actually form the CO and also it means that there's more uh, dust shielding uh, which basically uh, shields the CO molecule from the dissociating uh, radiation. And here we see the same thing again for the different radiation fields now going from the strongest UV on the left down to the weakest UV on the right and so now uh, as we decrease the UV we see a uh, stronger CO emission uh, and again, this is because this, uh, the UV tends to uh, destroy the CO molecules. So all of these uh, emission maps were created using the full non-equilibrium uh, chemical abundances. And then we can see what effect does the non-equilibrium ch chemistry have uh, on this CO emission. So to show this more quantitatively, I'm now showing uh, the average CO intensity over uh, the whole uh, disk. Uh, over the whole uh, disk of the galaxy as a function of time. So this is basically just taking from uh, 10 snapshots of the simulation. And this is from uh, the low radiation field uh, model. So this curve is what we get when we use the full non-equilibrium chemistry. Uh, and then if we take the same simulation uh, and just set all, all the gas particles to chemical equilibrium, we get the dash curve here. So we can see we would get, uh, we would see stronger CO emission if we just assumed chemical equilibrium by about a factor of uh, two or so. And then the blue curve is the uh, simulation that was actually evolved with the equilibrium cooling rate. So again, uh, assuming chemical equilibrium. So we can see that uh, when we use the full non-equilibrium chemistry, this can affect the, uh, the CO emission that we see by about a factor of uh, two or so. And so uh, I'll leave you uh, with the summary. Thank you. Questions? Okay, I'll. I'll. <laughs> That's it. Um, very nice. Um, with all these things, I guess I wonder about um, one about resolution for yeah. for things like the CO, uh, and I guess self shielding. Um, how how important do you think these are when uh, when you put in your radiation field? Yeah, so, so certainly in terms of the self-shielding, that's very important. So without the self-shielding, we basically wouldn't see any of the, uh, the molecules. Um, in terms of resolution, I agree particularly for the CO, I think that could be important. So um, for these simulations, we, so we resolve like, the, giant, the giant molecular clouds. We don't really resolve the, the structure within that. 
And I think that's particularly important for the CO because the CO tends to form in the sort of very high density peaks. So yeah, I agree it's possible we're missing some of that. And also like unresolved turbulence could also affect and also affect the non-equilibrium chemistry. So if you have uh, very rapid turbulence, it's possible that that will also move things out of equilibrium even further um, as well. So yeah, that's definitely something we need to uh, check further. Hi, so um, if I understood correctly, you're not following metal enrichment from, from feedback at all. Yeah, correct, yeah. And so I wanted to hear how you would think that, that might affect the results that, that we're seeing here. Yeah, so I think that, uh, that could affect it quite a bit. Um, so yeah, so we're just sort of seeing as we sort of tune the metallicity how that affects it. So for example, the very low metallicity run that I showed, it looks like there's almost no star formation, but in reality, that would then inject metals, which would sort of promote more star formation. So, yeah, that would uh, increase it. Um, partly for the Agora project, uh, Britton Smith and collaborators have developed a Grackle code, which is publicly available and includes non-equilibrium as an option. Uh, have you compared your method with theirs, and is yours uh, also publicly available? Yeah, so I haven't um, compared it with Grackle yet. So I'm mostly comparing with sort of equilibrium things like Cloudy. Um, so it would be interesting to compare with that. Um, yeah, so the, yeah that would be definitely good. So does Grackle also include like all the metals as well? Is it, is it only primordial chemistry in the non-equilibrium? Well, especially since we're primordial, uh, yeah. other people will have to ask the <laughs> metals are included. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that would definitely be interesting to see. Um, and yes, yeah, so this isn't publicly available yet, but hopefully at some point we can try to make it publicly available, which would be good. Yeah. Any last quick question just as we switch over? Uh, Laptops? No. Nope. In that case, let's uh, thanks. Uh, let's thank Alex one more time. <laughs> <laughs>